What I want to really talk about is what does this mean for labor? And I want to start, if you'll excuse me, uh, about to talk about a little experience I had on Saturday morning at, with Palea. Because I thought this was the most extraordinary experience for me. So, and you probably all know the Palea story, and it's not an accident that UN took me there because it is a celebrated story of collective labor resistance. Well, so what's the story? What happens? It's very simple, right? First of all, Philippine Airlines decides, and as it was explained to me by the General Secretary, Bonga's General Secretary, yes, so, hmm, Pukpal, yeah, so basically it wasn't in some dire economic straits, but it actually deploys a strategy of what you call contractualization, what other people call informalization, what other people call casualization, and what is called in now the North precarious, the rise of precarious work, precarité. So, that is the first step. But basically, the workers were told, we are intending to close your plants, we're closing, and if you don't accept the new contract to go from regularized to contractual workers, then you have to leave. So what happens? Some people accept the buyout. Other people accept the new conditions of work, casualized labor, precarious labor, with no benefits, no security of employment. And 800 people decide that they are going to protest. They are going to protest. And this is an amazing story of protest. But what is interesting also is that the very vehicle of a strike, as you now know, and it's not just Philippines, it's everywhere, the strike today is quickly turned by employers into a vehicle of domination. It's turned into a lockout. And this is happening everywhere. The one weapon that Labour thought they had, the withdrawal of collective Labour, is turned into a lockout. It's turned into a vehicle through which capital then employs people from the reserve army of unemployed as casualised labour under completely disadvantageous conditions without union representation. And this is happening everywhere. So what we see is that actually what is happening is that the struggles actually, and this is going to be a central point of my argument, struggles are in a sense no longer at the point of production. Those Palea protesters for a year now encamped, they are nowhere near the labor, well, geographically they're not far from the airport, but they are not employed. They are struggling effectively against the market. You know, the old struggles of labor were struggles in the factory, struggles around working conditions, struggles in the factory that generated better working conditions and better wages. The struggles, in my view, have now moved out of the factory into the market arena. This is a dramatic transformation that labor has to assimilate. Now, it is amazing, it is amazing that there is this continuing protest by Palea. I mean, I haven't quite seen anything quite like it. Certainly not in the United States for a year. They have no jobs, they have no leverage. What do they have? The only thing they have is support. They have support from the church. They have support from trade unions internationally and to some extent locally. They have support from lawyers, pro bono lawyers, and the possibility of actually using the law against capital, which is extremely difficult. And finally, they do have support from, they told me at any rate, from academics who can publicize the plight of these workers. So they are there still in a position of power and are able to perhaps generate some support for a boycott of Powell, so much so that the new management is now prepared to consider negotiating with these 800 workers and to see whether they can be their jobs can be restored to what it was they were before. 
But this is almost the exception that proves the rule, how difficult it is for workers to struggle in this context. The question is this. We have to think, what is labor? You know, Marx, I, I'm, I'm allowed to use the word Karl Marx. That's okay? Okay. All right. He's a friend here. He's a friend here. All right. Karl Marx made a very important distinction between labor and labor power. And basically what workers do is they sell their labor power, their capacity to work for a wage, and the capitalist or manager, the agent of capital, has to translate that capacity into real labor in the workplace. And Marx saw the struggles in the factory as the ones that would produce eventually a powerful working class. But I think the struggles are really today around labor power, the capacity of labor, the selling of labor power, the commodification of labor power. Labor and labor power, the labor process and the market. There are two arenas. Marx emphasized the labor process and what was happening in the factory. I think we now have to pay much more attention to the ways in which the new conditions of the sale of labor power. What is happening at Pelea is that conditions under which labor is being sold is really what is changing. The contractual worker is a worker who sells labor power for five months or that's, uh, that's the special economic zone, or sells it for five months and then has to, is released and then has to sell it for another five months. Under that way, they don't have any rights of the regularized labor force. It is the conditions of the sale of labor power that is crucial. Yeah. So, I think we have to move from the central concept for Marx, which is exploitation, that is to say, the ways in which capital extracts surplus from workers, to the commodification of workforce, of laborers, turning them into something that is bought and sold. Marx assumed that when you sell your labor power for a wage, the wage will sustain you and your family. You have a family wage. Or if there are two members of the family working together, they will form a family wage. The reality is that when labor power is now subject to market forces, unregulated, that the wage does not even sustain, does not sustain the family, does not even sometimes sustain the individual. Marx assumed that capitalists have an interest in reproducing labor force and giving people sufficient wage no longer because there's so much surplus labor in the world they don't even have to worry about reproducing labor power. So, we have to think in market terms, rather in commodification terms, rather than exploitation terms. Today, it is a privilege to be exploited. <coughs> what are those workers in the Palais encampment want? They want their jobs back. They want to be exploited. They're not exploited. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than being not exploited. Exploitation is fine. It's a privilege these days in so many parts of the world. And what is interesting, this commodification process, the sale of workers for a wage, is also associated, this is very important, with dispossession. And we're going to come to that in a few minutes. But basically, what happens in Palea is that these workers are dispossessed of access to their regular work. They are dispossessed of, 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 of the normal, regularized conditions of security of employment and minimal benefits. They are dispossessed of that and offered only a fundamentally weaker contractual relationship. And that is happening all over the world. Um, that workers are, in a sense, being displaced and then new sets of workers are being recruited. I mean, I was, I was just thinking today about looking at the floods that had occurred here three months ago, and I was comparing the situation in Katrina, in New Orleans, and here I was astonished by the capacity of the 
poor settlements, the poor people, to rebuild those settlements. Their flexibility, in a sense. They are continually being oppressed, and they are able, in a sense, to rebuild the conditions of their livelihood. You go to New Orleans, a very different story occurs. So what happens in New Orleans is the African Americans are in the end forced out of the city and then not let, not allowed to return. And the public housing is destroyed. And who now becomes the laborers? The undocumented Mexicans. So you see there is another way in which one form of labor power, conditions of, conditions of labor power are being replaced by another one. And capitalism is very astute at taking advantages of these crises. Very astute. Taking advantages of crises. We think that crises are going to favor the working class. I'm afraid we're going to have to think again. So, under certain circumstances, yes. But not at this moment in history.